Welcome to You Are History, Ohio Edition, a captivating series of interviews that spotlight the influential voices and impactful stories of Black leaders hailing from the vibrant state of Ohio. In this exclusive series, we delve into the lives, achievements, and experiences of trailblazing individuals who leave an indelible mark on their communities and beyond. Through engaging conversations and profound insights, we uncover these exceptional Ohio-based influencers, unique perspectives, challenges, and triumphs, showcasing the dynamic contributions of Black excellence in the Buckeye State. Join us on this enlightening journey as we honor these remarkable individuals' legacy, resilience, and innovation, affirming that in Ohio, as in the broader tapestry of history, they are not just making history, they are history. Don't forget to like, share, and comment where you're watching. Along the trail of life, you run into some people and you don't know them, but you hear their story and they tell you their story and you like step back and say, hmm. And then you look at what they do and they go and they begin start, they, they, they're, they've made history, they're making history and then they continue to make history. And they keep on going and they're going against the grain, but they're going with the grain, if that makes any sense. And the reason why I say that is because when I ran across uh, representative and then just Josh, attorney Williams, and he was running for office, uh, we were on a panel discussion right before an election, I want to say in Toledo, Ohio, and that's the first time I'd ever met him. And I was very impressed with him. And I didn't nearly know if he even had a chance of winning in the district he was running in. He said, oh, I'm going to win. And I said, oh, yeah. He said, oh, no, I'm going to win. And when I looked up that night, he on Facebook talking about, I did it. <laughs> and when you see the tenacity and when you hear the story um, of this young man, you know why he wins. And so I'm going to say thank you. And uh, Josh, we just do whole names here. We just call it like it is and keep it real. But we want to thank you for um, being a young man because you're one of the younger people that I am interviewing, showing that we are making history every day and we're writing our own history. So Josh, where are you originally from? So Tracy, thank you for, for having me on today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm born and raised from Toledo, Ohio, up here in Lucas County, Northwest Ohio. Who are your parents? So my mother is Eva May Lavoie, who's still with us here, uh, running around Toledo, volunteering every opportunity she has. And my father was Reverend Ernie B. Williams, who has passed away. And do your brothers and sisters? Yeah, so I have two brothers, uh, Justin and Jason, both of them my older brothers, so I'm the baby in the family. Now, your grandparents, are they here still, or did they come up from that down south, or do, can you go back that far? Yeah, I don't know any of my grandparents. So on my father's side, he was an only child. My dad was very old. He was 68 when I was born. He was 74 oh. when he died in 1990. He'd be over like 100 and some. Uh, years old if he was still kicking around and uh unfortunately i didn't, never got to meet his parents or, or any of the members of that side of my family uh, on my mother's side um my my grandfather on that side was a, a starch racist even though he was a full-blooded native american and uh so i've never really met uh any of my grandparents i've met a few members of my mom's side of the family but uh all of them are are I don't want to say all, a lot of them uh, carry uh, kind of this racial undertone whenever they, they uh, meet us. So let me ask you this, your grand, or well, your father, what was it like being raised by an older father? I don't, I don't remember much of being raised by him. Um, okay. So, um, you know, my dad died when I was five from cancer. Okay. I remember him laying in bed for over a year. I used to be a daddy's boy and then I transitioned to a mama's boy. So I have some memories from back then, but not a lot. Okay. So you grew up, so they came up here from, do you know from where? Uh, Tunica, Mississippi. Where? 
Tunica, Mississippi is where my dad was born <laughs> into a sharecropping family. And your mom? My mom, their family is from uh, Canada, French Canadian, uh, traveled down into Michigan and settled into Monroe, Michigan and Toledo. So what was it like being raised in Toledo, Ohio, Northwest Ohio, Lucas County? What was that kind of, what was the, what was your upbringing like? What did you go to school? What was it like there? Yeah. So first it was, it was pretty rough, you know, um, you know, when I was born, like I said, I was born to a 68 year old dad and a 26 year old mother at the time. Um, my dad was a reverend. Um, we struggled, you know, I grew up in poverty. My dad passed away when I was five. Eventually, um, we were able to move out of the inner city and move into West Toledo towards the University of Toledo into an apartment complex. I went to Old Orchard Elementary at that time that kind of exposed me to uh, different groups. I grew up in the inner city, all black schools. And when we transitioned out there, it was more of a mixed culture. So I was able to pick up friends um, because I was an honor student. So I was exposed to a lot of white students and their families. And I was able to expand my horizon. And that pretty much was my upbringing all the way up until 18. I stayed in that same apartment complex. You know, I navigated the same school district, uh, DeVoe Junior High, and then start high school. So you went to public schools? I went to public schools. Um, okay. And then as a senior, uh, at the age of 18, I dropped out of high school when I became homeless. Whoa, stop. So you went to the whole school district, school, school system, and you were fairly, you were a good student. I was a honor student. And then what happened that made you homeless at that time? So I, tur I turned 18 at the end of my junior year. Uh, my mom was kind of done raising kids. I was this little bit rebellious teenager. She had gone through terror with my middle brother um, in his teenage years. And then I was, you know, uh, going through a phase where, you know, I didn't want to listen to mom anymore. I'm a young man, you know, I'm feeling myself. And uh, so I'm 18 and uh, she helped me get my first apartment, helped me sign that lease at the end of my junior year and you're out on your own. So all summer, you know, I worked three jobs and I paid my bills. And when school came around, I had to quit two of those jobs to be able to go to school from, you know, uh, 8 a.m. until 3 p.m. Can I ask you a question? Did you sure. outgrow your home? Because the reason why I say that is a lot of times I know with myself, uh, my mother had her own house, her own rules, her own set, and I outgrew her home as a young girl, so I had to leave. And it wasn't that I left her, but I I got grown quick. And you can't have double grown people in the house. And I think sometimes, sometimes of our young people, they are in their parents' home and they can't go by their parents' rules and they yeah. burst out of the rules and they go out on their own prematurely because they can't control themselves inside the confines of this restrained house. Yeah. So I, I would I would I would kinda say I outgrew my home. So what happened was at sixteen my mom moved out. Um, at the time she was going through a contentious relationship with my middle brother who had also been out on his own now. And she moved out and moved in with the roommate. Um, and I'll, I'll back up a little bit. So my mom has always suffered with mental illness. Okay. And um, she did what was best for her at that time. And uh, because my dad was an older gentleman when he passed away, I received survivor's benefits from Social Security. So that paid for my rent you know, my lights, my gas, essentially. So at the age of 16, I was kind of on my own, but within uh, an apartment, my mom had her name on, if that makes sense. Yes, sir. And my social security paid all the bills. So when randomly she would come home and try to put her foot down about a rule, it wouldn't make sense to me. I'm, I'm getting myself up for school every day. I'm putting my clothes on, I'm washing my clothes, I'm doing dishes, I'm feeding myself. So I, I kind of matured at a young age. And then it kind of caused conflicts when it came time to me be about 18. And I, I wanted to get out on my own. I'm paying all the bills myself. I would might as well get out on my own. And what happened was when I was 18, um, Social Security has these renewal policies where they automatically unenroll you. And then you have to prove that you're enrolled in school to get back on. And that happened in the fall of um, my senior year. And around the same time, I was being young and dumb and I was being around people that, you know, engaged in criminal activity and and uh, my leasing uh, 
uh, department wanted to evict me at the time. And I fought the eviction for a little bit, but eventually I was evicted from my first apartment. So then I'm essentially homeless, nowhere to go. So a friend of mine took in all of my furniture and stuff. And, and there was periods of time I'm, I'm bouncing from couch to couch. And there was periods of times where I slept on park benches out by Largemont School, uh, uh, hoping to be able to get up in the morning when the sun came up and go to, go to class. And I did that for a few weeks, struggling to continue my education. And eventually I dropped out and had to work to kind of uh, pay, pay my way. So now wait a minute. So you went to work, paid your way, got out of school, but I called you attorney Josh Williams. So somewhere along the line, you picked up another book, another way, and decided to make a, a to go into doing a different direction. What pivoted? What clicked? <laughs> what something happened? So you can't go from. I came out of school, I busted out the house, I said, I'm on my own, they put me out. Oh, but by the way, my name is Representative Josh Williams, who happens to be a Jewish doctorate, huh? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> you became, uh-uh, yeah. help me out. What yes. happened? No. There's, there's a lot missing. and There's a whole lot missing. Whoa, dude. So there's what? a long, there's a long period of time. I don't know how much time you got, but there's a- we, there's, you go, a, you're gonna have to tell some more story here because this is the, the stock you can't jump from i right. jumped out and i won <laughs> you, what'd you do you bought your degree on i am 3d absolutely not <laughs> so what what happened next in in my life story is is that um i met my first wife so she was in my girlfriend and my fiance she got pregnant um so i went to work for a uh railroad company as a subcontractor around so you've that. never been adverse to work no i was a hard worker i i, I you, love no matter what was going on you was always working yeah i, I love I, i've never been without a job until i was disabled so i was working hard i was working as a railroad subcontractor making my way uh at the time you know um my ex-wife was nine months pregnant with my son and at the age of 21, I fell uh, 30 feet off the side of a train and destroyed my spine. So um, by the time I was 23, I was fully disabled and, and bedridden. So at 23 is when I had my first surgeries. Um, and uh, in, in January of 2000 and, uh, 2008, I had my first surgeries. I became disabled in December of 2007, but in uh, January of 2008, I had my first back surgery. Then I had another surgery in May of 2008. And then from that point forward, I was fully disabled for the next six years. So I laid, I laid in bed. But hold on, wait a minute, slow down. <laughs> That's a life altering. You wake up, you go to work, you know, we, we, we take for granted. We get in the car we get the day is gone and you get up you go to work and you when you wake up from work you're in the hospital and they're telling you this is what's going on with you and you can't move now you are a full-bodied black man and now your life has changed yeah, yeah. what goes cool. on in your mind at that time and then what keeps you still moving because some people don't keep on moving they lose their drive. They lose yeah. their will. Yeah. And I and I lost it. Um, did you lose it? I did. So in, in the beginning, when I had that happen, the doctors thought it was just a minor injury and, uh, you know, gave me some, you know, anti-inflammatory drugs and told me to go home and take a couple of days off of work. And I, I, about a week later, I returned to work and tried to fight through it. And it got worse over time. And at the age of 23, I took a nap on the couch. When I woke up, I couldn't feel my legs. And, uh, we, you know, paramedics came and I, I go to emergency room and, and they tell me I need to go and see specialists. I go and meet a chiropractor. They do some tests and they, they realize I have, you know, several herniated discs in my spine. So I have surgery in 2008, twice in six months. After that point, pain was excruciating. I couldn't even stand up. So from 2008 to 2010, I laid in bed bedridden. Mm -hmm. um, couldn't even make my way to the restroom. Eventually, in 2009, 
by then I had seen every specialist in Toledo, every neurosurgeon, every orthopedic surgeon. And they told me that I would be lucky to ever walk again without a cane or walker, which I was walking with at the time. And in uh, 2009, I made arrangements for my ex-wife to take my son and my two stepkids to uh, Meyer, and I sat on the edge of my bed with my gun and planned on killing myself. And uh, my three-year-old walked in. Mm. Something that told my ex-wife to leave him behind in that moment. And uh, he walked in and stopped me from doing the unforgivable. And after that point, there was just a, a shift in my mindset. You know, I, I, I laid there and I cried about what I was asking God to forgive me for what I was about to do. And and in that moment, I made a, a covenant with God. I promised to him that if he put put a path in front of me to get me out of that bed, that I would work my butt off. And he held up his end of the deal. Within a month, you know, I was meeting the right lawyers. A month later, I met the right doctor and Dr. Dejuga. You know, and my, my life started to change. You know, they sent me to Cleveland. I met the right specialist. 2010, I had a fusion done. Or actually, 2010, I had a, a disc arthroplasty, which is an artificial disc done. It failed. In 2012, I had a, a full fusion done of my spine to my pelvis. Wow. 2013, because by that time, I weighed 458 pounds. What? Yeah. So in 2013, I had weight loss surgery at Cleveland Clinic at a gastric sleeve. And I started to lose the weight. My spine was stable. And I started to get out of the bed and exercise, move around more. And I felt good enough to return to work in some capacity. Now, let me ask you this. As you as you as you went through this, 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 this series, there was a lot of. I, this is my new theme now. Kids said life be life. -in. There's a lot of life that went on and there were a lot of decisions that you made that weren't easy. You had to have a get up. You had to have a go. You had to keep pushing. You had to keep driving. What do you tell other people when life comes in and steers you in a direction that is as painful and as arduous because again, you're going with your wife, ex-wife, you got things going on. Life is still happening while you're in pain and trying to figure this out. Yeah. And as a black man, it ain't always easy being cheesy. Yeah. So in, in, in that in that moment back in 2009, you know, when I was ready to end it all, I was I was ready to ready to just flip the light switch because I was looking at myself as a victim. I always had this victimhood mentality, you know, the same mentality I see plaguing our country. Where I used to, you know, cry out to God and curse him. Why did I have to have a dad that was older? Why did I have to be born to a mom with mental illness and the intelligence level of a, a seventh grader? Why did I have to struggle as a kid? Why did I have to have dead roaches surgically removed from my ears at the age of six? Uh, because of the living conditions I was in. You know, why do I have to drop out of high school? You know, why do I have to fall all while I'm being faithful to you? I used to cry out to God about that all the time. And in that moment when he sent my son in, I realized that God stopped me from doing that because his assignment for me wasn't over. And that's why I promised to him, if you got me out of that bed, I would do whatever I could to complete that assignment. In that moment, I stopped looking at myself as a victim and i realized that god had already had claimed victory over my disability it was just up to me to claim it in his name and that's that's the mindset shift i went from being a victim to a victor and i, I promised if you give me every opportunity available i'm going to overcome no matter what and since then there hasn't been an obstacle that i face where I get down and depressed about it. How important is it that you become a victor, especially for men? How important is that we take on, you take on this, this mantle of being the victor of our community, the victor of our families, the victor of our nation? How important is that we put men into the victorious seat again? 
I see it as essential, not only for the growth of us as a people, but the growth of our nation. The victimhood mentality is plaguing our community, and we always look for excuses and easy ways out. And I used to do that. I looked at those obstacles as hurdles and burdens that were holding me back, thinking back and saying, man, what if I didn't go through a decade of that? Where would I be in life? And, and, and eventually I realized that God had allowed me to go through those obstacles to build up the wherewithal to overcome. So now when I'm faced with an obstacle, I get excited because I get to come up with a way to, to get around it, to get over it, to dig under it, to break through it. Adversity is not something that we should run away from. It's so something we should embrace that builds character that our opponents don't get to experience. There is true magic in being black in America. Ah. Why do you say that? Because we know our history. We know the struggle. We know the present culture that holds us back. That even when we make it into the room, they look at us as the only reason we're there is because we're black. We know those obstacles that we face and our opponents have never seen it before, experienced it before or overcame it. So when they are faced with adversity, they, they cower over and beg the government for relief. They beg the government to make sure nobody ever has to go through that struggle again. And for us, we know no other option but to wake up, put our boots on, and get to work because there was nobody coming to save us. And there's still nobody coming to save us. It is up to us to fix our community, up to us to get back to having a nuclear black family. It's up to us to overcome. That doesn't mean we can't make it easier for the next generation. But we got to get rid of this victimhood mentality and claim victory in our communities. And with the right leaders, we're able to do that. While you were rehabilitating, as you step, as you go through this process and you go through these surgeries and you come out, how do we get to, you don't go back to trains, planes and automobiles. How do we get to academia? How did you get pressed and say, okay, I'm using my brain, but I was smart. I left this. I'm going to go get my proficiency. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do this. How did, how did we get there? Well, I had three kids that were looking at me as a role model inside my own household. <laughs> What'd you and say? Three kids? Three kids. So I have my, my son, Matthew, and then I had two step kids that I raised, uh, you know, for over 15 yes. years. And I looked at all three of those kids as mine. And know, they looked at you and they looked at you as, as dad, huh? Yeah. And, and, and they had watched me lay in that bed for six years. They had watched me blow up and gain 200 pounds. They had watched me cry after surgeries that were so painful. They had seen me sleep for days at a time. And I wanted to make sure that they also saw me overcome. So when I finally got stable, we went to war with the state of Ohio. Because the way the workers' comp system is set up, that if I would have enrolled in vocational training, college, without their permission, they would have cut off my disability check. Hmm? They would have considered me maximum medically improved and uh, sent me back into the world saying, well, you can work if you can sit in a chair for eight hours. So we fought. Myself and my attorney, John Palafka, we fought for over a year for me to be able to go to college. You know, less than 2% of our injured workers get any vocational training before they return to work. Less than 0. 0.0002 get training over six months. And 0% get to do training for two full years. So we, we went to war and we were ready to file a lawsuit. And um, they, they made me go through a bunch of hoops, aptitude testing, uh, uh, physical capacity exams to prove that I was fit enough to go to college and smart enough to succeed. And the final caveat was somebody else had to pay for it. They will keep my check coming, but somebody else had to pay for my tuition. What? 
So a group called Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities footed the bill for my first two years of college. They paid my tuition and my book stipend for my first two years. And once I got into college and I started being around people that were intelligent like me, motivated like me, and loved learning like I did, I wasn't going to stop. So after those two years, we did a physical capacity exam. And it said that I could work a maximum of 20 hours a week. And a law firm that I had a relationship with, I needed to do an internship. And I requested that I got to do my internship at Groth and Associates in Toledo. And I became their first ever intern. Um, and I started working there. And when I was done, they offered me a job as their first criminal defense paralegal. And we worked on an arrangement where I worked 20 hours a week and was able to still go to school. And from there, from the time I hit college at the age of 30, by the time I was 35, I graduated from law school with three degrees, including my Juris Doctor. Please tell me your degrees. <coughs> what you, you said three degrees? Please three tell me degree. what they are. So I have an associate in applied science and paralegal studies. I have a Bachelor of Science in Paralegal Studies with a, a specialty in litigation, and I have a Juris Doctorate with a concentration in criminal law, all from the University of Toledo. Great school over there. I'm not going to knock it. Wow. So now we look at other people. We look at people along the way. And they have, life can blow hope out of you. What do we tell people to get a win behind them? Get up, you know, you know, you hear Donnie McClurkin saying, get back up again. We fall down, but sometimes we stay down and it's hard to get up. You have some people around you that helped you get up. Who were your mentors? Who are the ones that stuck their hand out and say, you know, called you on the phone? Yeah. Who are the ones, because everybody's got their little nucleus of people that, it, hey, 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 who are the ones that said, you, you, I think I can, I know you can. Yeah. So the first one was my doctor, my chiropractor, Michael Jujuga. Um, when I started college, I had to get a letter from him saying I was physically fit to go to college. And he made me shake his hand and agree that if he wrote that letter, I wouldn't stop until I became an attorney. And I told him it was crazy. <laughs> I'm 30 years old. You got to go to school for seven years to become an attorney. I'm just trying to get back to being able to make money for my family, man. I'm never going to go be an attorney. And he wouldn't sign that document without me making that promise. And we came to an agreement that if I could get my tuition paid for and I didn't have to rack up a ton of student loan debt, that I, I would try and become an attorney. And there was there were some difficult points along the way that he held me accountable. You know, in, in my second year of law school, my 2L year, I went through a divorce. My 15 year relationship was ending. My 13 year marriage was over. And uh, as part of my divorce, they were trying to use the fact that I was in night school uh, or at least I had evening classes on Thursdays, Tuesdays and Thursdays against me in uh, determining the custody of my son. And as a black man in America, I was not walking away from my kid. <laughs> so at, at the end of that divorce, I had full custody of my son. And I was prepared to drop out of law school in order to make sure I had custody of my kid. I have to ask you about that. Yeah. Custody of a kid. What do you tell black men about the importance of being in that kid's life? Well, I don't got to tell them anything that statistics doesn't show. The fact that 70% of our young mothers are are raising children on their own without the father in the household has resulted in a higher increased number of black kids being incarcerated, more kids dropping out of college, more kids turning to violence, more kids being in poverty and being unemployed are all tied towards being in fatherless homes. And then statistics have shown that kids that are raised in two parent households or even in a single parent household where the father is the residential parent, they perform 
just as well as if they were in two parent households and outperform those that raise in single mother households. And that's no knock on our single mothers, but it shows empirically that there is a need for the father to be in the life of the child, not only in their life, but in the home. But you know, it takes, two to, it takes two to make. It does. You can't, you can't make it with one. You yep. cannot make, you, you without, a, you, in a Petri dish, you still gotta have two. It takes two to make, it takes two to raise. Yeah. And we need to be more mindful about what we're doing before we do it. We need, and I, and I need, we need to slow that down. People need to think before they jump into things. I, I, I agree. I and, also, and, and, and don't get me wrong, but this happen, life happens. But with right. life, that's all right. But with life happening, with life happening, you know, don't you don't have to stay in situations you can't be in. But we need to make sure that your our children, parents, are, those kids are important about how they feel about their parent and their mom and their dad and don't use them as pawns and make sure that dad is able to be in the house and make sure that mom is able to take care of you or however that works out. Because children are affected yeah. so drastically. Because yeah. they are innocent and all they know is they love mommy and daddy. I and agree. so when a man steps up and says, I got my kids, especially today, because we need that man, we need that testosterone in those lives, especially a young boy. I'm going to say especially because girls need daddy too. In a major way. So you, you become this great lawyer. You've got all these degrees. You are doing just fine. You are, I believe, championing some, some cause over in Toledo at some time. And then you get a great idea that I want to go to Columbus and become a state rep. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, but I mean, I mean, I, I, don't get me. I appreciate the public service and I know we give you a great big paycheck and a lot of appreciation and too many perks that you can imagine. So people think. Yeah, isn't, that's not true at all. I, said, I know. I know what the job is. So people think and you spend like 100 miles on the road going between Columbus and 23 because you don't even have a good shot downtown. No. So on 23 trying to slide by state troopers stop you too so please <laughs> tell me what 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 god what motivated what god mo god motivated you yeah to decide okay i'm gonna take public life yeah so when i when i when i graduated from law school i thought that whole time that god was put me um you know in those positions to become a lawyer Right. I had some things that happened along the way. I was falsely accused of two felonies as a sophomore and indicted. I fought for my freedom in my name. It shifted my focus from workers' comp and social security law to criminal law. And I thought, you know, this was all part of his 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 path for me that I was going to become this criminal defense attorney, make a ton of money for my family, and ride off in the sunset. But when I got in the industry, I was confronted with a system that's unfair, unjust and ruins lives uh, merely by getting indicted like I did. So I saw all these holes that were in the system that needed to be filled, all these problems that needed to be fixed. And I started to become disenfranchised as a lawyer. And uh, about four months before I got married to my, my beautiful wife, Niera, after I graduated from law, uh, law school, I walked in and I told her I didn't wanna be a lawyer anymore. And uh, as you can imagine, my wife, now wife, wasn't too happy, right? She told me I need to suck it up. <laughs> um, and I did for a while. You know, I continued practicing and generating good revenue for us and pay for our wedding with no debt. And um, when that was over, there was still this emptiness in me. I could tell. So along the way, you talked about, you know, falling off that path, obstacles get in our way. And that's the way I look at life. I, I look at, you know, God's path for us is like a game trail in the woods. You know, it's been beaten down and it's a little bit easier to walk on. But if you fall off that path, you know, there's still going to be hills and rivers and valleys. But now you're getting hit in the face with bushes and branches and thorns because you're walking on your own path. 
You may finally get to the place where he had intended for you, but you're going to have a lot more scars, a lot more stories. So I, I operate my life by trying to trying to realize when I'm walking on a path he has for me and when I'm, I'm walking on a path of my own creation. Hmm. And I could tell that, that that path of just being a criminal defense attorney was a path of my own creation. So I went to prayer about it and told God the same thing I told him when I laid in that bed and I was ready for a change. Hey, if you show me the path, I will put in the hard work. And almost instantaneously, I was introduced to politicians <laughs> and and po political movers in my region who, who will come up and say random things like, hey, we heard you might be running for public office. And I said, I don't know who told you that, but they lying. Because I'm not even registered to a party. I'm an independent. I, I prided myself on not voting in a primary. And although I was a conservative and a secretary of the Federalist Society and, you know, a, a, um, a libertarian at heart, um, I never saw myself going into public service. But the more I looked into it, the more I could see myself having an opportunity to fix the problems that I knew about. And I looked at the legislature and I, I saw that there were no real criminal defense attorneys, but yet they pass bills that affect the criminal justice system on a daily basis. And maybe that was God's role. That for says something. You need, that's, a, that, that, that's a pause moment. That's another conversational moment. Because we need to come back and visit that on a show. Yeah. So, But when you look at community corrections, you did you say that there was no criminal defense attorneys inside of... Yeah, there still isn't, other than me. There, People may dabble in it if they're general practitioners, but there's no dedicated criminal defense attorneys in, in the Ohio House or Senate other than me. Wow. And they make the laws. Yeah. So they. that's why we have a, you know, a ton of bills that just increase penalty, increase penalty, increase penalty. And there's no criminal justice reform other than, you know, when Representative Bill Seitz, you know, drafts some great legislation. There's a couple other champions of criminal justice reform here. But it, it, it gave me an opportunity to bring a different perspective to Columbus and especially, you know, when, so that's when I ran for office and, you know, I walked in, I told my wife I wanted to run for office and, and unlike before we got married, she told me to suck it up. This time she looked at me and we had a heart to heart conversation and she said, if you truly have an opportunity to go and do that and not only run for office, but run as a Republican, holding on to our Christian morals, our, our beliefs, our conservative values and you get a chance to go represent us in rooms we haven't been in in decades, then you better go run. And my campaign started and we swung a, a district and January 3rd of 2023, I was sworn in as the first black Republican in the Ohio house in 50 years. Say that again. That was history. Isn't it? Is that, was that not history? It was. We went half a century without anybody looking like us being in the room when decisions were being made by the majority party here that controls Ohio now. Isn't that amazing? And no one paid attention to that. No, well, they paid attention. They just called everybody racist uh, <laughs> because there was no blacks instead of um, looking at conservative candidates as potential members. And you will be surprised when I reached out to the Ohio Republican Party about potentially running, how receptive they were to me, not because I was black, but because I held on to their conservative values. I was articulate. I came with solutions to problems and they were open to having minorities in the party. They just didn't have any good candidates that were coming forward. So when I was sworn in, I made history and my colleague, Michelle Reynolds, uh, was sworn in to the Senate. She's the first right. one in the Senate and over, over a long time, I think over the last one was in the 1990s. <laughs> Yeah, um, in, in the Senate. And both her and I are making history. You know, we put pressure on, you know, a group that's supposed to represent people that look like us within this legislature. And they had to declare that we weren't welcome merely because we were Republican. And she's doing great work over there in the Senate. I believe I'm doing great work here in the House. And there's a ton of, you know, ton of work to be done. But the people of Ohio that look like us now know that when the majority party makes decisions in Ohio, either I'm in the room or Michelle is in the room. 
I've been saying this and I continue to say this. If you're not in the room, you're on the menu. And I applaud you being there because we need to have you there and in other rooms. And we need to continue to get behind you and others like you to open doors so that we can open doors for the future of our children behind us. I think Ohio is a great state. And I like living here. And with you and Michelle being down in Columbus, um, you're real people who believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that means a lot to those of us who are believers. And that means a lot to the black community because you know as well as I do, that's where we come from. We all started off in somebody's church. Yeah. And we are where we are because God has given us grace. But I thank you because now you're holding us accountable and them accountable. And I appreciate you for that. Because you have worked hard to get there and you're new in there and you're making waves there and I appreciate that. Now your wife now, her name is? Niera, Niera Williams. How important is it that you have a good spouse by your side while you are working? I think I think it's important that I have a, a spouse that's understanding because it's a true time commitment. It's a sacrifice. We talked about, you know, People think we get paid a ton of money. You know, I, I I lose a lot of money being here in the legislature where, you know, my practice has uh, shrunk two thirds. You can't you don't have time to practice. You can't right. you can't you can't be in court and on the floor and at, 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 at Columbus at the same time. Yeah. I mean, and I teach. <laughs> so I'm, I'm also a college <laughs> professor up at Adrian College where I teach constitutional law, criminal law and criminal procedure. So I, I spend my Monday nights teaching as well. Uh, and you, uh, we don't get a paid a lot to be an adjunct professor either, but it's another form of me giving back um, to the young minds in our communities. And this is a sacrifice. My wife and I sat down and we understood we were going to make. But, you know, no one told us that life was going to be easy. We see the struggles that are in Scripture all the time. Right. And this is just part of our journey again. Right. And when I when I get called home. To my father, he's not going to ask me how much money I generated for my family and how big my house was. He's going to ask me, did I spread his gospel? Did I carry myself Christ like? Right. Those are the only questions that I need to answer at the end of this all. So I have, I have a wife to make sure she's happy. But, you know, in our calling, she found her calling. So not only does she work in a, for a Fortune 500 company in corporate, but She's also a real estate agent. You know, she found her calling in real estate and helping minorities um, gain home ownership, build generational wealth back in Lucas County. And now she's as busy as I am. So uh, <laughs> it's a little bit easier of a transition now. Before it was it was rough for a little bit. Well, listen, as long as you guys keep each other first, what um, what, what does black history mean to you? So black history is not just looking at the marks that we have created in building this country, but looking at the obstacles we had to overcome to get to where we are, not forgetting our past, celebrating those that were able to overcome and help uplift others, but also celebrating the present and the future of what we have, understanding that the struggle continues, that every day we have an opportunity to make new Black history. I'm proud to say that, you know, when I'm dead and gone, maybe it's going to be written somewhere down here in one of our chambers that in 2023, I was able to add to our black history here in the state of Ohio. And I hope to do more while I'm here. But it's to show appreciation for those that came before us and fought a struggle that we didn't have to face. They made it a little bit easier for us moving forward. And now it's our job to pick up that torch, carry that mantle, and make it easier for those that come after us. Break down more barriers, more walls, open up more windows, more doors, dig more tunnels to make sure that we are in the rooms 
when decisions are being made that can affect our community and our families. Well, Representative Josh, I'm so very, very pleased and very proud of you. God bless you. Thank you so much for being a part of our history. Thank you. Because I believe you've only just begun. Any closing comments? I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you here today. Uh, you know, my office is always open to members, not only of my district, but anyone to reach out on issues that Ohio is facing, that our community is facing. And I promise I will put the hard work in to try to find a reasonable solution to address that issue. And I pride myself on coming up with creative solutions when it seems like we have no hope, because that's what I did for myself. And I'm going to hold him to it because I know where to find him. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Thank you. We extend our heartfelt gratitude to each viewer who has joined us on this journey through your history. Suppose you have found inspiration, insight, and connection in the stories shared by our remarkable guests. In that case, we invite you to consider supporting the continuation of community programming like this through a donation. Your contribution will help us amplify diverse voices, celebrate rich histories, and foster meaningful dialogue that uplifts and unites us all. We also extend a special thank you to our sponsors whose generous support has made this series possible. May you, our history continue to resonate in your hearts and minds, inspiring you to embrace the beauty of diversity and the power of unity. Thank you for being a part of this transformative journey and we look forward to welcoming you back for more engaging and enlightening content in the future. Don't forget to like and share this video, subscribe to this channel, and give God the glory.